Robert McKee, another screenwriting teacher, said, stories are the creative conversion of life itself into a more powerful, clearer, form, more meaningful experience. And we all know the power of stories. We all tell stories. Here are two techniques that might make them even better. Speak visually. We use words to communicate however our audience sees our stories. And that's how they can walk out and explain the five moments to their friends because they saw your story. I was at the local chapter in Oklahoma City National Speakers Association. Woman came up, I said, you know, like I'm doing this afternoon, we did yesterday, you come up, deliver the opening, and we'll put it under the magnifying glass. Look at it, take a closer look. And she said, my dad walked into a diner, looked at the waitress, and said, that's my wife, in 1946. I said, I bet this is a good story, and I hope it has a happy end, and you're the result. Unless he, she didn't talk to him, and your dad marries someone else, but I don't think that's the story. I said, what you need to start with is when was it? In 1946, my dad walked into a diner. You do not have to have been born in 1946 to know that's the end of World War II. You don't have to have been born in America. You've seen enough movies. You've heard stories. You've read books. You even know what the diner looked like because of theme restaurants and movies. Now, I don't know about your story, because we see our stories differently, but to me, her dad's in a uniform. He's a soldier. And I know he has experienced situations he will never talk about. Not to his future wife or children, not to his civilian friends. I have an emotional connection to people who serve our countries in any branch of the armed forces. So I'm rooting for this guy. And remember, all she has said is, in 1946, my dad walked into a diner. When we set it up the right way, people see the scenes. Because I bet, I bet he walked in alone, he sat at the counter. And I bet the waitress, and I know what she looked like, she was blonde, she had a little cap, she had a penny over her dress, she had thick, rimply shoes, and I bet she said, would you like some pie and coffee, honey? And he thought, that's my wife. So I challenge you to revisit your stories. When did it happen? Put it in context for the audience. Where was it? Help me visualize. Take me to the scene. And as Michael Hayes said, get into the scene. Don't, you don't need the setup. Where was it? Who is in it? And of course, what happened? And in the context of your speech, the result of that was. So follow the formula. When, where, who, what happened? Next principle. Don't report on the dialogue, deliver the dialogue. If you say, I had a conversation with, with my boss and we were talking about, that's not delivering the dialogue, that's reporting on the dialogue. Pat Wynn called and said, Patricia, as you know, we are a $2 billion software company with aspirations of being 20 billion. We have just bought our major competitor, and so we are having a very important kickoff sales meeting, 1,500 salespeople at the Bellagio, and as 40% of them were acquired, they did not choose to work with us. This is a very important meeting. We want them to know they're at the right company at the right time, and the strategy is sound. The work you've done with our engineers and leaders has been fabulous. Now we want you to work with our president. He's not a bad speaker. He's an engineer, little shy, brilliant, but we don't have any corporate rock stars. We want you to write him a speech, turn him into a rock star, 
and you got four hours. Now, Bernard was the m most magnificent gentleman who, from the moment we worked together, when I said, how do you do? If you had one sentence rather than 45 minutes, what would you say? He said, this is a brand new company. I said, good, write that down. Welcome to a brand new company. Now, wh whose idea was it to be a company? So we conversationally talked through the speech. And people kept saying, it's five and a half hours. Bernard's still with Patricia. Because he realized the impact he could have. And then it got to the point where we were talking about corporate citizenship. There'd been a tsunami and the salespeople had donated $360,000 and the company had matched it. And it was obvious. He was passionate about this. He believed in corporate responsibility and corporate citizenship. But his speech was getting boring. Now, certainly, if I had developed a relationship with him, I would be quite comfortable to say, it's getting boring. But this was the first time, and I was boosting his confidence. He didn't realize he could be a rock star. And so, what I asked was, Bernard, how do you explain corporate citizenship to your children? He said it was the day after Christmas. And I sat both of my children down and said, you are very lucky children. You have generous parents and you have even more generous grandparents. Perhaps you would like to give us one of your gift certificates or one of your presents and we'll take the money and give to the children who no longer have homes. He said, I was so proud of my 14-year-old son. He came back the next day and he said, Papa, how much do I give? I could give you all of my savings, all of my pocket money, and all of my Christmas presents, and it still wouldn't be enough to make a difference. What do I give? And Bernard said, I told him, oh, you never give it all. You just give enough that it hurts a little. If you were to transcribe Bernard's story. You would see the quotation marks, and it is nearly 100% dialogue. That's delivering the dialogue, not reporting on the dialogue. So as we look under the magnifying glass, you know if you want your subject to be of interest to your audience, speak as an audience advocate. Look at from their point of view. Use you focused language. Look at if you can set the flavor and make your whatever opening you select, make it add to the experience. If you want your stories to be even more appealing, certainly deliver them in dialogue and remember the formula. Help people see them, make them visual when, where, who, what happened. Now, as you heard from my magnificent introduction, the Fripp kids, Robert and Patricia, I am one year, one, one year, one month, two days, 12 and a half hours older than my brother. My brother says, I'm not surprised my sister gets paid to tell people what to do. She was a very bossy little girl. We had the reputation of being the best behaved children in Wimborne. He grew up to be a famous guitarist. I grew up to be a hairstylist and have the honor of being one of your speakers. And as you heard, I used to be a hairstylist. That was my yellow page ad at the time when the way you got business was to have the most appealing yellow page ad because that was long before the internet. And I started my speaking career by training hairstylists for a hair product company. And I was explaining to my brother one day that when I taught people to cut hair, they'd have to cut the guide, make the framework, do the lining and the edging, and then add the magic. And it didn't matter how seasoned and experienced they were. You have to prove to me you can cut the head of hair 
exactly the way, the framework that I teach you. And then I said, once they prove they can do it, they can do anything they like. And he said, well, of course, sister, because you always have to master technique in order to abandon it. So if you ever hear someone say, oh, that speaker is great and he breaks all the rules. No, 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 you don't understand. There aren't so much rules for speaking as principles, age-old principles that have always been there and always will be there. And what your speaker who you think is breaking the rules is doing is understanding the principles and making different theatrical choices than you think is normal or CAPS approved. And I would also explain to my brother that how I teach people to structure a presentation is exactly the same as how I used to teach people to cut hair. And how often we look at movies as principles because a screenplay diagram is exactly the same as the Fritz diagram on its side. And how did you realize that every rock band opens with his second best song and their uncle closes with their best song. And the brother said, well, of course. Sister, the principles in any one field of endeavor are exactly the same as the principles in any other field of endeavor. So when you go to a movie or a Las Vegas show or a rock concert, you write that off. because you are learning the principles in a different venue that can apply to your presentation. <laughs> My brother and I frequently deliver presentations together when he's not on the road. His group King Crimson just performed their last concert of this tour last night in Paris. And the presentations we deliver one of our favorites and most popular is how to be a hero for more than one day, based on a story of a call that David Bowie called from Berlin and said, Fripp, can you come to Berlin and play some hairy rock and roll music, which ended up to be, of course, heroes. And before my walkaway line, if my brother Robert were here, this is how he would conclude our presentation. In strange and uncertain times, such as those that we live in, any reasonable person might despair. However, hope is unreasonable, and love is even greater than that. Let us trust the inexpressible benevolence of the creative impulse. And his sister would add, never overlook the power of well-chosen words delivered by well-intentioned speakers who act as one. <laughs>